Quantum mechanics is grounded on a certain number of postulates. These are the ground truth statements, the fundamental assumptions of what makes quantum mechanics work. This is the theory of quantum mechanics as, as pure and distilled as you can possibly make it, the, the simplest possible thing you can say. Now, uh, there are different numbers of postulates uh, depending on uh, how authors choose to combine certain statements or split them apart or add certain things, or, and there are disagreements and debates of what are the fundamental postulates, what are some extra ones, and etc. I like to stick to seven postulates, seven statements that makes all these together make quantum mechanics work. This is quantum mechanics. If you want to know what is quantum mechanics, this, these seven statements are exactly where you need to start. First, the first postulate of quantum mechanics is that a state, a quantum state, which is our list of everything that we can possibly know about a quantum system, we represent as an arrow pointing somewhere in an infinite dimensional space. Like I said, quantum mechanics is pretty abstract. It is a very abstract theory of nature. Here's your first abstraction. Like, how does this even connect to what observations of electrons and energy levels in an atom and all that? Well, let's keep going with seeing how the other postulates play with that basic assumption. The second postulate of quantum mechanics is that every observable that is associated with a system. Anything that I want to inquire about the system or I can learn about the system is going to change the quantum state of the system I'm studying. And this already, this here, and by the way, this change takes place by moving that arrow around in that infinite dimensional space. Uh, that's how the mathematics is baked in into the postulate. Uh, but, but already this is a break from classical physics because in classical physics, an observation doesn't change the state of something I'm studying. If I'm watching a baseball move uh, from me to you and I'm watching it with my eyes and light is bouncing off of that baseball and I'm observing it, the act of observation doesn't change the nature of the baseball itself, it keeps doing what it's doing. I can always assume in classical physics that I'm an independent observer and that my observations do not influence the universe around me and so I can gather perfect information. But in quantum mechanics, we know that the act of observation changes the state. And this isn't too surprising when you're dealing with tiny little particles. If I'm looking at an electron, in order to look at it, I have to bounce a photon off of it and get it to my eye. But the act of bouncing a photon off of the electron is going to make it move. And there's no way to get around it. The act of observation changes the state of a quantum system. The third postulate of quantum mechanics is that when I actually go to make an observation, and get a measurement back, sometimes my choices are limited of what kind of answers I'll get back. This is the quantum and quantum mechanics. So sometimes, let's say I want to inquire about an electron's position. Uh, its position, if I put that electron in a box, can be anywhere in that box. It can be over here, it can be over here, it can be over here, halfway here, halfway. It can be anywhere. We say this is a continuous observable. Uh, it, it, its position is continuous. It can have any value it wants inside that box. But when I go to ask that electron instead, what is your energy level? And I make a different observation. Well, its energy level in the box is fixed to a certain number of potential values. It can be at the first energy level, the second energy level, the third energy level, the fourth energy level. It can't be at half an energy level or one and three quarters of an energy level or pi times an energy level. It can't have any value at one. It has to have these fixed intervals. Uh, the analogy I like to use if I go to a kid and I ask a kid, hey kid, how tall are you? I can get any number I want right? Uh, it can be as fine and precise of a number with as many digits after the decimal point as, as you can possibly imagine. But if I ask that kid what grade they're in, ah, their grade is quantized. They're in the first grade. They're in the second grade. They're in the third grade. They're not in one and a quarter grade or three and five eighths grade. They're in a fixed number of grades. Their grade is quantized. And this appears, does not appear in classical physics, but does appear in quantum physics. Uh, the fourth postulate 
is that in quantum mechanics, the results I'm going to get when I actually make my observation. And notice a lot of the postulates of quantum mechanics are concerned with observation, the act of measurement. When I actually go to measure something, when I actually go to observe something, the answer I'm going to get is going to be random. Now it might be confined to a certain set of values. If I put an electron in a box and it like the, bo the electron is going to be in the box, especially, yes, sometimes it can be outside the box, but like if it has infinitely high walls, um, the electron can't get out of the box. And so it's going to be in that range, but I don't know exactly where the electron is going to be until I go looking for it. I don't know exactly what energy level the electron is going to have until I go looking for it. This flies in the face of classical physics because in classical physics, you already know ahead of time, uh, you can calculate what the answer is going to be. In quantum physics, you can only calculate probabilities. It's like when I go to a kid and ask him what height they are, they already have a height. The height already exists. They are already in a grade. Their grade already exists. And I'm just finding out through the act of observation what that answer is going to be. But in quantum mechanics, it's like going to a kid and saying, hey, how tall are you? And they don't have a height until I actually go to ask. Or they don't have a grade until I actually go to ask. Like they don't have a grade until I ask. And then when I ask, there's like a, a random number. Like, you know, you imagine those spinning prize wheels above their head. And it goes and it randomly selects a grade. And they just say, I'm in the third grade now. Before the act of me making that observation, before me asking that question, they did not have a grade. They only had chances of, appear of appearing in certain grades. And once I make the observation, that's when they get assigned a grade. This is weird and unintuitive, but that's quantum mechanics for you. The fifth postulate of quantum mechanics says that once I make a measurement and get a result back, if I make that measurement again, I'm going to get the same answer back. And this is very, very strange. Well, I'm, at first it sounds like totally normal, but this what this postulate does, what the fifth postulate does is elevate the role of observation and measurement in quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics, when I make an observation, when I make a measurement, I am almost creating a result through the act of observation. So we go back to this kid. They don't have a height. The kid is just some amorphous blob. And when I ask them, what is your height? They get assigned a height and that height gets locked in for the rest of their lives. When I go to ask the kid, what grade are you in? And the spinning prize wheel spins, lands on an answer. I'm in the fifth grade. The act of measurement, the act of observation, the act of asking that question created a grade for that kid. Created a grade. And now they are in that grade forever. This tells us, the fifth postulate tells us that measurement does something special. It doesn't just affect the state of the object I'm studying. It somehow performs an act of creation uh, that is very, very different and very, very strange and very, very weird. Uh, I'll get to this more in future videos because this is the measurement problem. This is one of the big issues with in trying to interpret quantum mechanics is the role of measurement. The sixth postulate is uh, tells us how quantum systems evolve in time and it evolve, they evolve, evolve in time via the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation tells us how quantum states evolve from one state in time to another state in time. And finally, the seventh, seventh postulate is that there is this quantity called spin and it exists. So uh, spin is this weird fundamental property of, of subatomic particles that kind of looks like angular momentum but isn't really. It's very, very weird. We only discovered it through experimentation. It turns out that once you fold in special relativity, you can actually find an origin and an explanation for spin. But in pure regular quantum mechanics, uh, you have to just say that spin exists. So that's it. That's quantum mechanics. Everything else in quantum mechanics, entanglement, uncertainty, uh, wave particle duality, collapse of the wave function, uh, and quantum computers, uh, nuclear power, everything else in quantum mechanics flows from those seven fundamental statements. So if you know those seven fundamental statements, 
you know quantum mechanics. Congratulations. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe, and go to patreon.com slash pmsutter, and I'll see you next time.